Welcome, this is David Powell. I am with uh, ACORSE, and this is our ACORSE technical webinar series, which we started earlier this year. And tonight's module is on artificial intelligence and audit. And I'm very pleased to be joined this evening by Scott Galen, director from MindBridge. Scott has been uh, in the software business for many, many years and has held uh, several executive roles with IBM, as well as working with Clarity based up in Toronto. And he also lives in the Boston area. I am uh, also in Boston, and I stepped down as president of ACORS uh, earlier this year, and I'm now leading on what we're doing for education and technology. I've been active with ACORS for about 15 years, and our final member this evening is Chris Easton. Chris is the new ACORS vice president, and he's also CEO of Applied Logic. Uh, there's plenty of other details on the screen. Uh, you can read them at your leisure. So this is a link back to our last presentation where we talked about what is the future of auditing. It was one slide in a present presentation on the whole uh, impact of disruptive technology on the future of our accounting profession. And you can actually access that presentation from our, our ACORS website at www.acorse.org. And the points we made is that audits still need to be done. Auditors need to be remain trusted advisors. But the key things, and I'll focus on the blue items on this slide, we need more sophisticated tools We've got a much bigger impact of technology. We're getting deeper insights, looking at areas where, where risk is highlighted, and we're providing analysis and assessment of performance so that overall we can improve and maybe even move audit from the cost side of doing business to adding business value. So one of the ways we can do that and hence our focus on future skills, is looking at how artificial intelligence can help augment our auditing techniques for the future. So with that, Scott, I will pass to you. Thank you. So when we talk about big data, obviously the hype is off the charts, like literally, right? It's something that's every day in the press. And whether you talk about you know, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, which I can't even count to or think of how many zeros that might be, or the fact that the amount of data is doubling over 18 months, we keep talking about this. And so I always like to pull back and try to say, why, why is this so important to us, especially in auditing? So if you look at this iceberg, you can see we're starting at the bottom part of the chart. This is where we are today. And it's really about how do we take big data and machine learning and actually make the world smaller for us? Because today we grapple with that bottom part of the iceberg. It's a ton of data for us to manage. So we use conventional methods like dedicated infrastructure or traditional sampling techniques. We try to look for patterns that we know might exist by searching for you know, reversal or certain patterns of numbers or materiality or items like that. And what big data and machine learning says is if I can look at enough patterns, I can start to present to you a smaller number of items for you to review. So I can, in essence, make you more effective, more efficient, more productive, because I'm reducing the aperture of what you need to review and look at. So the whole point isn't necessarily to give you more with big data. It's actually to make the algorithms more sophisticated. So we present to you fewer and fewer possibilities, which allows you to spend your time in a more productive fashion. And so it's not just the technologists that are talking about this, right? If you think about Almost 70% of CEOs talk about data and analytics being the greatest asset for them. And it's because if they can find the patterns, if they can make this more efficient and effective for their teams, they can personalize their service. Or like the CEO here from Bank of America talks about, you know, whether it's marketing, whether it's risk management, whether it's product creation, everything becomes more targeted and more focused. So it's not just auditing we're looking at, this is across the board. So if we start and we think about intelligence claims processing, today we generally go around, if it's over a certain dollar amount, we send a body on site. But what if I could look at your past record compared to a bunch of other things and make it more personalized? What if I could reduce the cost of delivering legal services by allowing a paralegal to become more productive, fewer hours for the lawyer, opening up the world of law, right, to more people and more law services. And then lastly, on oncology. If you think about it, the challenge isn't, you know, the sophistication of the physician, 
It's the overloading of the physician of what they need to know. So again, when we talk about personalized medicine, what brings us to that is the ability to run through millions and millions of patterns and look at those and therefore say, individuals like yourself, who have followed these specific drug trials and fit these specific patterns, here's what's most likely to give you the best results. And I think that's an important part of what we talk about it. At MindBridge, separate from this, we talk about making you more effective. It's not about a black box. So the leveraging of the technology is not about replacing you, it's about making you more efficient and effective, right? We try to present to you the patterns, you make the decision whether those patterns are substantive or you know, just erroneous. And if we look at the adoption, which is on the right side of the chart, this is what we tend to see across all industries. You have certain groups that look at this and say, this is an opportunity to change. We can do something different. We can be more effective. We will leverage this to change our process. Then there's another group, kind of the middle line, probably looking to adopt the technology to some level, but not really looking to change their process or go that far out on a limb. And then there's a lot of different terms for it, but that bottom part, right, who in, that, in some sense are going to resist change as long and as much as possible. And this is true across all industries. And surprising, if we look at internal audit, it's no different. So if you look at the left side of this chart from PwC, you'll see that they talk about almost two thirds of internal auditors understand right, not improving technology and the associated risk. We get it, but at the same time, our appetite for making change, it's relatively low, right? If you look at that top bar, it's about 15% want to evolve, right? So the point here is to understand and figure out how you can, in some sense, take bite-sized steps forward, make progress, make change, and go forward. So when I talk about machine learning, and auditing, I like to try to start with a pretty concrete example, just so we can see firsthand the difference in the sophistication of the algorithms and what that could mean for you. So on the left side of the chart, well, let's just start with the top. This is a services business. It amortizes its revenue and it takes one twelfth of it in every month. You could see someone transposed an entry, that's the top circle. Now, if I presented to you the numbers that are on the left, and just looked at the numbers themselves, it'd be pretty hard to see the anomaly, right? A fairly simplistic look at, let's take an average, let's take a skew from the average, let's try to figure out which number doesn't fit. But if I have an added level of sophistication, if I had the capability to look at each and every financial transaction, understand what the debit and credit flows looked at for that particular company, and then was able to say, for this individual company, this particular flow between these specific accounts was unusual. And that's on the right. Again, this is a simplistic example because all the revenue was booked in a certain way. But you can see how much more it gets flagged if I have a level of sophistication on my algorithms that let me look at it this way. And the goal isn't to find individual items, right? The goal is how do we build this up? which gets back to making you as a team more productive. Today, when we tend to approach an audit, we tend to do things in a pretty consistent fashion. We do it the same way we do every time. We have some knowledge of the division or the individuals, the levels of controls maybe, we look back at what happened last year, but we tend to be approaching this in the same way. If I had headlights, if I could do something different, if the data spoke to me, if it gave me insight, if it's set up front, you know what? You can spend a little less time on the inventory. We're not seeing any risk there. But by the way, you want to spend more time on the receivables. This is an example of the headlights. And this is just headlights on the chart of accounts. You can imagine you have headlights in lots of different ways. And this is an example of leveraging AI to give you something ahead of time so that you can become more effective in how we spend our time working with an internal audit client and getting back to what I think we all want to do, right, is advise them the best way to be managing their business and understand where their controls should be maybe tighter and other areas maybe where they're, you know, lagging and they could release them a little bit because it's cumbersome. All that based on data. 
So fundamentally, who is MindBridge? We're an Ottawa-based software company. We make an analytics software platform for financial professionals, specifically for auditing. We don't do anything else. This is what we do. We use something called Ensemble AI, which is kind of just a fancy term that says we bring multiple sets of algorithms to look at the data. And we combine those algorithms to give you a single risk score. So another challenge we've heard in the market today is I can look at my data from a couple different perspectives, but it's up to you to keep it in your head to combine those. So I'm seeing this set of anomalies over here, this set of anomalies caused by this different rule, a third by a different rule, and I manually have to figure out how to put that all together. What we've done is we score each and every transaction from 25 plus different views, and then we combine that into a single score. And that single score allows you to look at the entity easily and quickly and make a judgment. And if you want to, you can dig in underneath that. As I said before, we look to supplement your judgment. Our goal isn't to make a decision or tell you how to do an internal audit. Our goal is to point out to you irregularities and anomalies. We kind of look at it as a third seat at the table, right? Today, we have industry expertise. We have knowledge of the company that we're working with. Now sitting at the table with us is someone that has insight into the data, and we leverage that to make decisions. That doesn't mean they're right. Doesn't mean it's the only opinion we look at. It's just another informed opinion that we use to decide to where we spend our time. So with that, I'm gonna give a quick demo of the software. So since we're a little short on time today, I'm not gonna take you through how you ingest the data. We're gonna just jump right into the analysis part of the demonstration. What you're seeing here is what I call the high level dashboard. And fundamentally, you have two views of working with the data. So you can look at it at a 10,000 foot level, or you can jump right in and have a very granular view of each transaction and look at each individual one. So most of the time as an auditor, I'm gonna start with the dashboard. And you can start and look at the anomalies in a couple different patterns. You can look at it from a pure risk base, what I call like a stoplight view. You can see here's the grouping of green, here's yellow, and surprisingly red. If you wanted to at any point in time, you could click on those individual items and you could see here's the items that are red, right? A score of 50 or above on a risk score. As an example, if I wanted to see more detail on one particular item, any votes on whether I should pick 450 or 999, any preference here on what we pick? All right, I don't see a preference. We'll just start at the top here. We'll go with this one. So what this is telling me is surprise, surprise, there was a fire. We wrote off $450,000. Now, normally if I was doing this, right, I'd probably mark this as something we would want to follow up as a team. And we'd probably simply say, you know what? What I want to see is I want to see the insurance report. I probably want to see the receipts that went in to prove there was money there. And maybe a fire report. And I would assign it to an individual as an example. In this case, I'm just going to assign it to me. I could pick a particular date. And in essence, I create a task. Most of the time, what we hear today, what happens today, this is done via email. People spot things and they're sending things around the company. And that gets more and more complex as you start to send things around the world and try to summarize where are we in conducting an audit on something. So today, this puts us in a centralized system. So let's go back to the specific journal that we're looking at. And so I could look at the headlights if I wanted to. A second way to analyze the data is a time perspective, right? Which is key to us with auditing. Often I wanna kind of block out the low and I wanna focus on the medium and the high. And not surprising here for a company that closes its books end of years, we see spikes in these particular time periods. And if I wanted to, I could drill into December and January. I could see what transactions are there, probably mostly around revenue recognition and understanding what happens there. And the goal again, isn't necessarily to find the specific transactions, it's to pull back and understand what controls were in place that led to this and what controls that potentially were bypassed or not followed that we had things like reversals going on. Were the proper bookings done? Do we do a credit check? Was there an authorization? What happened that allowed an order to flow through that we in essence reversed it? 
I could also look at the items by the accounts. So here's an example of a graph that splits it out by the chart of accounts. So I could scale back on my assets and go further and further out to more smaller classes of accounts. Here it's basically telling me, you know what, the asset classes of accounts look pretty green. So going in here, I might want to reduce the amount of time I spend or adhere, but here on the expense side, I might want to dig in. Now this particular graph is atypical for something like a general ledger. If I was looking at something like payables, I might want to look at something, a graph that looks like this. So today, most of us probably understand who our big vendors are, and we have some analysis of who our spend is and whether it's done correctly. This adds an element of risk. So I'm not only looking at the firms we do business with, but I'm understanding the firms that we do business with that have the highest level of risk associated. So it's another depth that I could look at. I could look at this same level of information, for instance, and look at it by user. So I'm not looking at simply who approves the most POs as an example, but I'm looking at who's approving the, the highest level of risk POs, right? Why is this person here and why is this person here? What is different that's going on? It could be nothing. One could be in a certain division that just has a lot of risk. It's just the way it is, but it is probably something we want to look at. So this is the high level data. And lastly, if it was of interest to me, I could look at certain periods or certain rules. So if I wanted to, I could look at, for instance, show me everything that happened on a weekend. Show me everything that was reversed or the reversal. Show me materiality. I could look at any particular grouping. Once you get past the large grouping, you could go into, as we did before, and look at the specific data itself. And this is really how we work today when we do our testing or our digging in. We take sets of data and we want to sort it. So we tend to, first of all, pick particular accounts that are of interest to us. So we look at receivables. We probably look at inventory. We look at revenue. And I could here just either go into the specific sub accounts if I wanted to, like I could get to specific types of revenue. Or if I wanted to be more general, I could just say, you know what, let me just pick the revenue sets of accounts. I could also pick, let's say, a certain dollar amount. So I only want to see transactions that are over, for instance, $100,000 or something like that. And I could individually look at these items now, or I could say something, you know what, I want to capture these and look at them later. So I'm just going to launch something that says, how many transactions do I have? I would just want to pick them all. So I'm going to just do all 32. It's going to pick them all. It's going to capture them. And I can go analyze them at a later point in time. I can work through these what is ever of interest to you and however you sort your data. And the goal again is to make you more productive because it's in essence like your dashboard or your cockpit as you decide how you're going to work and do an internal audit. Lastly, which might be of interest to you, and this is becoming more popular not just with us but across the board, is the introduction of natural language processing to how we work with data. So for us, this is in beta. But we're kind of showing you, what if you wanted to type commands and say something like, show me risky transactions that were over a certain dollar amount. So this gets back to how do we make technology easier and easier to use? So to date, one of the challenges has been the tools we tend to roll out require a level of sophistication, whether that's the scripting within Excel or if we use a BI tool or something like that, the individuals running these have to have kind of almost like a degree in data science or comp sci and at the same time be an auditor. One of our goals is how can we make this simpler and simpler so we're more focused on the audit part of this and less on understanding how to sort and manage data and what to look at. So an English language interface into the tool, or in our case, English and French, because we're Canadian, obviously makes it easier for people to do. So I've showed you kind of high level ways of working with the data. So once I've done that, where is the data captured? And this is all captured here in what we call kind of an audit plan. And I'm not gonna take you through the individual items. I think you get the point. Most of us today are mailing the spreadsheets around. We capture certain items, we consolidate it. We're individually trying to consolidate all those items, usually in a multi-tab spreadsheet and trying to keep track of where we are. We've, in essence, put this into a, a web utility that
that allows you as an organization to keep all the different audits that you're doing, the status of what's going on, who owns a particular item. For instance, something unexpected happens, someone's gonna be out of the office for two weeks. How do I know what they were supposed to be doing? If it's all centralized in a single place, I can see who's it's assigned to, what's open, what's closed, so on and so forth. So that's how the software works. And, and this is true for, for, in general, how we apply AI to auditing. Where we think we're a little bit different than most companies is that balance between the sophistication of the algorithms and the ease of use. And just so you get back to kind of the sophistication of the algorithms, here's an example of if you so choose, you can go in and alter how things are flagged. So this is just a weighting control that allows you to go in. So for instance, if you were doing a particular division and surprise, surprise, there are groups of people who batch entries. I know we think that never happens, but surprise, surprise, that still happens. And so let's say we came across a division where they had tons of entries that they kept batching on the weekends, right? We really wouldn't want to spot those as anomalies because that's how they're doing their business. So in this case, I could just simply weight out that control to zero and analyze that saying in this particular instance, let's take that out. Or in other organizations, there are certain keywords. So for instance, if you're in the technology, you might have certain arrangements with distributors, right? And there are words we would use to describe discounts and things like that, that you'd wanna capture and be able to add those specific keywords in. You'd also want to know maybe there are manual entries that you'd want to discount. So our point is you have the ability to control this and we tried to do it in a fashion where we made it simple and easy for the business user to manage here. Lastly, we have a built-in set of reports that help you just understand general trending analysis. Not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you can see kind of the fundamental flow of the software. We ingest the data we give you a couple different ways to analyze that information, and then let me follow up on that, whether that's individual items or through reporting. So that's MindBridge, that's what, what we do. I hope I not only gave you a snapshot of MindBridge specific, but you get a little bit of a flavor of how you could be applying AI, but specifically machine learning with more sophisticated algorithms to internal audit. So with that, I'll take a pause. Great, thanks Scott. Uh, any questions? Question, the type of data you're dealing with in this machine, is it only dealing with structured data? Did you actually use unstructured data as well? Right. Great question. So the question was, do we only do structured data? So we not only just do structured data, we do structured financial data, specifically your ledgers. And there's a trade-off in this. So we're only focused on auditing. And so only focused on auditing is we take your ledger. And why do we do your ledger? Because every piece of financial information in your organization is built off of a ledger transaction. When I, in essence, finally get to my financial statements, what's really underneath all that originally came from a ledger. So we start with the most basic element because that's where the data is born. And we do that, for instance, for the general ledger, for your accounts payable sub ledger, for your accounts receivable sub ledger. So it's really good for auditing. It's not good for oncology. It's not good for insurance. It's not good for a bunch of other industries because we don't analyze their data. We only do auditing data. So back to your question, not only structured financial, structured financial ledger data. Um, so you could see that there, there were a few examples of like the, the various things that you're looking for. Let's say the last three last three digits are nine 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 or zero 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 whatever, and this will kind of identify various anomalies or, or, or potentially fraud or things like that. A lot of the people who want to perpetuate fraud are not the brightest. Mm -hmm. but there are a lot who are, yep. and they'll always be one step ahead. Not specifically to mind bridge, but when you're talking about machine learning and you're talking about solutions like this that can that can provide additional information, right. how much of the, do these tools also adapt their own algorithms to come up with other unusual things as a result? Like how great, much great, of it is yeah. learned versus how yeah. much of it has to so be great. Right. So the question was the sophistication of the algorithms and how does it progress on a fraud perspective? So maybe let's start where we are today and, and where it's going. So where we are today we tend to have to be smarter than the person giving fraud. 
because when I analyze the data that I'm looking for, I have to know what I'm looking for specifically in most of the tools out in the market today. And we have built in rules in Excel or we have built in graphs in BI that we tend to look at, but I have to know what I'm looking for. The base part of our machine learning says, let's pull back from that. Let's just look for pure anomalies in the data. As the algorithms get more sophisticated, and by more sophisticated, I mean A, a larger pool of data, B, being able to take multiple companies and compare industry specific, compare size of the organization, I begin to be able to present you an anomaly, not just an anomaly to the entity, but an anomaly to other organizations. I can also take the data itself and compare it to third party individuals. And so if I go back to the, this chart, just to answer your question, the future part is that cross correlation. If I look at that last piece, you can see that adds a set of elements where I start to add more third party information into the sets of algorithms that I look at to make that more sophisticated. So can I go at credit databases? Can I pull the industry data? things like that. In essence, to stay one step ahead of where they're trying to uh, look at fraud, you try to increase the aperture of the data you're bringing in. And by doing that, you in essence, have a larger population to pull anomalies from and use that as the basis of where you're starting from. One of the challenges when you're just conducting it on one particular company, if you've never seen that anomaly before or that type of fraud, it's specific to that organization. But if I can pool everybody together, I have a better view of what those areas are and what people are practicing. So the way we see kind of progressing in that front is that cross correlation, as well as adding more and more individual algorithms, both on the statistics part and the machine learning part. So as a follow up to that, Scott, uh, is this industry specific at the moment or is it applies to any industry? is the way our approach is or in general? Well, you, you say you're gonna go cross correlation, so, which means you're gonna probably specialize it for a particular industry and a pattern within that industry. Where is it at now? You know, uh, so it's actually, we're more at the moment dealing with privacy. So when we approach this with some of our clients, and so I, I don't wanna speak in AI in general, I can just speak us personally. When we've had this conversation with clients, most of the place we're getting stuck is the privacy of the data. It is not our technical capability to pull this together. It's help me understand again what you're doing with our data, where it goes, who it sees. So for us, we're kind of trying not to bite off more than we can chew. We built it into the product, not all of it, but some of it. We talked to a couple initial customers. We got kind of the privacy hands up. So our view was, okay, one step at a time. Let's start here and let's add this sophistication as we go. So for us, Again, if you think about it, if we can pull together all of your members, as an example, and share all that data anonymously, think how much richer your sample sizes would be, your ability to do compares, um, because you're not just comparing in the Northeast, you're saying, I want to compare a retailer of certain size, X, Y, and Z. Here are the key anomalies we're seeing or patterns we're seeing. How does that compare to that, that entity? Thinking back to when I use much more basic kind of rudimentary versions of what this is now, one of the challenges we always had was getting the data in, it was just horrible, and then cleaning up all the false positives that were yep. the most, which then people say, well, why would I bother right. trying this? Because it just costs the time. Yep. I'm curious how, how you've addressed that or how much. It still is a problem. I don't want to pretend that it's not a problem. It's still a problem. So we... I would say when we talk to clients, data ingestion is still like one of the top two or three headaches. So we have applied a level of AI to the data analysis part. So when you ingest the information, again, this is our approach. I don't want to speak for the industry. This is our approach. We understand, you know, there's subtotals, there's totals, and those in essence are duplicates and pull them out and things like that. So we've applied a level of intelligence to it. We've applied a level of capability that allows you to pull into your specific chart of accounts and then export the chart of accounts. So you can do some compares. We also uh, show some balances up front. And lastly, we actually throw people at it. 
So the way we approach this, it's a service. We recognize the exact point you're making that it's going to be a challenge. And as much as we throw technical solutions, you need some people who are just good at data cleansing and understand the structures. And so part of our offering is what we call it a white glove service is included in this are people who know how to get the data in and out. I can tell you for internal auditing, it's a little bit easier because we you tend to have a much more uh, defined set of data you're looking at. You could think of a challenge for an external auditor who's got 1,500 different clients using 1,200 different accounting packages and ERP packages, right? The number of variables in that world is very complex. We tend to find the internal audit maybe a little bit of a challenge the first time through, but then dramatically drops off because we see the same type of data. Just as a follow-up on, you mentioned internal and external audit. Uh -huh. Do you have both types of customers? Yes. We see actually both groups kind of feeding each other in some sense, working off each other. Internal audit using it because then external auditors see that there's a higher level of preparation. We've looked at this. So the goal of saying, can we make the external audit less cumbersome? as well as external auditors using it as a method of differentiating and helping their clients as well. And it's not necessarily just for the traditional financial audit, but whether it's some level of forensic or specific type of looking at, can we use this sophistication to give more value to our clients as part of an external audit? Can I expand on that, Scott, a little? Bit? When, are you seeing any instances where you have clients who are internal, using it for an internal audit viewpoint? How do their external auditors take that happening to their data? Do they rely on it or do they want to redo it all themselves? So I wish I had an answer so far. The question was, you know, in essence, how much are the external auditors taking into account the internal auditors have it? We've been in market about 15 months with the product. So we have clients in both cases but we haven't been with them long enough to know kind of the outcome with that. So a couple of years back when I was, uh, as an auditor, we used to use uh, CATS. So uh, to get uh, some insight into anomalies of data, right? How, how different is this compared to that? Very different and the fundamental difference is the sophistication of the algorithm. So the challenge with most of the CAT tools that you're using gets back to, I needed to know what I'm looking for. So I would go in and start and say, you know, two things. One, I'd be writing a set of rules, which up front means you have to know what you want to see. And the second piece is it would come back to you with what I call um, segmented data. So for this rule, this these were the items that were flagged. For this rule, these were the items were flagged. And then you had to figure out how to combine them or not combine them. And you would, in essence, be looking through a lot of data. And as, as someone said before, a lot of false positives. So the two things that we do is one, we apply the machine learning to start to look at what we in essence call the unknown. So instead of searching for the known, we let the software look for an anomaly. It's an anomaly, period. Whether it is fraud or an error, that's for your decision. But relative to the data points, this is an irregularity. So that's the first thing. We spot in essence the unknown. The second piece is, We've spent a lot of time to try to tune the algorithms to give you a single risk score. So instead of you manually trying to combine 10, 15, 18 different uh, results from rules, we've combined that into a single risk score for you. And then as I showed you, right, you can look underneath that and see why this individual item was scored. You can see the subcomponents of those items to say, okay, this was scored a 58. Which individual items did it trigger? But what we've heard back from our clients, that second piece was a giant productivity drag because I kept just getting more and more. Every rule I add is more data I have to look at. You can think about it this way. Every rule we add, it's no more data. It just makes the algorithm more sophisticated. So when we started a year ago, there were 18 or so algorithms. Now we're up to 26. It's still the same amount of data you're analyzing. It's just more sophisticated. And then the first thing gets back to the unknown versus the known. With the machine learning based to it, it's unknown. With the CAT tools, it's the known. So in terms of the 26 rules uh -huh. that you can, you showed us how you could weight those rules. Right, if you chose to. If you chose to. So they're out of the box. What if you want to add a new rule? Yeah, I would probably say that's number one for most organizations is, can you open this up and allow us to add our own rules um, and do things? So on the development slate, but not tomorrow. 
So I think it's safe to say that regulatory bodies are not on the high end of innovation. Um, generally accepted auditing standards will in many cases contradict sampling methodologies that are based on AI. How does one overcome that or discuss with their external auditors or, you know, especially if it's, you know, for SOX purposes or right. whatever, you, you, you need to kind of show what you're doing, why you're doing it and have it accepted. So, um... The question was, in case people couldn't hear, is how does this fit with the guidelines and rules around uh, governing bodies and making sure we do things in a certain fashion? I try to be very careful in the words I use for exactly that reason. So what I don't espouse is I can reduce your sample size because then I would be telling you to go against those govern governing bodies. What I can tell you is I can be more effective in which samples you are picking. So what I like to talk about is let's wait till the governing bodies catch up for the moment because I can talk to you about reducing your sample size. But what I talk about is if you're going to go fish, let's go fish where the fish are. What I'm giving you is a bunch of headlights into where your fish are likely to be. So as you choose your sampling, as you saw in the example before, what we're advocating is do a risk-based sample approach as opposed to a pure random-based sample. So with a risk-based sampling, you're saying let the software do a pass over all the data, assign a risk score to it. And then when I go back in and test, I'm going to pull from the different risk buckets. But instead of, in essence, peering pure random, I'm going to more skew my selections to the higher risk items. I'm also going to take some low risk items but I'm gonna skew to where the fish are. So that's where we get back to, I'm not gonna debate the sample size at the moment. I'm gonna you know, follow the governing bodies on what they state, but I am gonna tell you I can be more effective underneath by picking the items where the, where the fish are. That's the first thing. The second piece is by combining that data into headlights, I get back to you have the discretion when you go in to say which accounts and how much do we want to do and we give you headlights into that as well. So when I um, aggregate the risk scores, I can aggregate it by time period, by account again, and you can then choose to reduce or increase the throttle as to where you spend time you know, looking at that data. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that CAT versus AI, right? You mentioned that in CAT, we, we knew uh, what we want to find and we put that. But in AI also, you are writing algorithms that you are writing it, right? you know what you're going to you're looking for so then how it is different sure so today um, in a cat rule you're limited by the sophistication of what you write it's a rule-based approach and so a rule-based approach is different than a machine learning approach in theory could you have written you know cat is a generic term so it is a label for a rule-based approach or algorithm to looking at data we are not a rule-based approach. We have rules, we have expert systems, but we also have machine learning. And it's that combination that distinguishes us from a pure rule-based approach. What kind of objections or barriers to people trying this do you come across the market? Is it just conservatism in the auditors? Or I can think of tons of reasons for people yeah. are interested when you come across. Sure. Stuff. So um, I'd actually say, I'm, I'm surprised at how fast people have embraced some of this. So we've been in market 16 or 17 months with the product. We already have over 125 clients. And so as a technology firm, that's a lot of clients in a pretty short period of time. Now, most of those clients are trying to do some form of A-B testing and see where it is. But I would say the pace at which people are saying, this train is coming, we need to get ahead of it, is pretty high. Where most people are trying to figure out is a little bit to, to the question over there. How does this integrate into my process? How do I integrate this in the most effective way as possible? Because on the other end, what we don't want to do is make the audit more arduous, make it longer, make it more costly, right? We don't want to do that. So as you integrate this in, you're trying to integrate it into a process that says, I, I want to be in some sense streamlined, more effective, more value add. So that's where we're actually spending most of our time with our clients is into the process. How do we integrate this? What's your level of approach today? What accounts do you look at? Um, so that's where we're spending our time. And another way is a little bit uh, a different approach. 
So there are limitations today fundamentally to um, just sampling. So if you're trying to understand the controls around spend, for instance, and one of the ways people get around spend is they split a PO as an example. Well, sampling doesn't work for a split PO because in order to see that something was split, you'd have to find both POs. So you'd have to redesign your approach to look for a type of sampling that knows to look for multiple items that are related, right? That's not conventional random sampling. So another piece we get into to answer your question is, so dig one layer into the algorithms and how does it work and how do I potentially change my process again to recognize, wow, you can look for things like this in a different way where I couldn't look for that before. Scott, so you've, you've been working with clients now for 15 months and you've been doing various pieces. Can you give an example of something that you've uncovered that surprised the heck out of the client? Yes, I can. But I'll start with an external, then internal, a top 10 external audit firm. This was their forensic group, so not a financial audit, but a forensic audit. And they used our software. And the interesting part is they went through it and they said, you know what? You found five cases, four of the cases we found, the fifth one we didn't know about. The second thing they uh, found from us is getting back to how do we make the big feel small. The instance of what they found, um, I want to say was something on the neighborhood of their original find, it was the 300th item in their list. With us, it was like the eighth. So you get back to, you know, reducing that aperture. So yes, could I use a, another tool to potentially flag it? Yes, I can. But in this instance, they had to go to 299 items before they saw that first item of fraud. With us, it was in the top 10. So it gets back to, by the sophistication of the algorithms, we both found something they didn't, and we found it uh, in, our, in our rating of the items, it was much higher in the scale. That, that, was would, the, that was the external that audit. That was the external audit. Uh, on the internal audit side, I would say what we have found is more on the controls piece. People have been surprised at people, I guess you shouldn't be surprised, not necessarily following the controls in place. And the way they were able to see that, if you get back to, was the control point indicators and listing groupings. So by saying, for instance, why did we have 15 reversals in this particular division? And it, it necessarily wasn't anything bad. It was the fact that their controls around their initial ordering weren't as tight as they would like it to be, and people weren't necessarily following, uh, I forgot the term for it, but uh, standard, standard order acceptance process that they had. So those would be two examples. People were ordering goods, and then they were, after they'd ordered them, they found out they shouldn't have, and it was being reversed. And right. And either the person wasn't authorized or was over a certain dollar amount without a second signature or the credit check wasn't done, things like that. So as a follow-up to that, you're not actually testing the, the procedures. You're just seeing it surface in the actual numbers. Yes. Okay, as a normal. Right. And we're pointing out to you where you may want to go test the procedure or look at the procedure based on the fact that I'm seeing, is in this example, a bunch of reversals or I'm seeing a bunch of split POs you know what, you might want to go look at what's the control and what's the documentation that talks to, how do you deal with a vendor and when are they allowed to have multiple POs in a certain period of time. So you, you mentioned POs, but you know, what I've seen in your product demonstration, you're only testing really the general venture, AP and AR. Right, so if I look at AP, for instance, and I look at, let's go to configure for here, if I go to the payables control points, you can see these control points were specifically designed for people issuing POs, okay. and you can see just a vendor, we call it flurry. So you can see we're specifically looking for an amount that happens as well as activity. So all of a sudden, are we starting to see lots of activity with a specific vendor, and are we seeing certain amounts that go under dollar amounts? What about other sub-legions like inventory? Uh, on the slate, like that? yep. We picked these two because they were top of mind with our customers, but our goal is to, as fast as we can, get the rest of the sub-ledgers out as fast as we can. 
Thank you, Scott. I'll chime in again. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Scott. That was good. Um, it'll be good to see where this uh, develops. I think we'll probably have uh, a need to revisit this at some point in the future. We will have a, a next webinar coming up, um, hopefully next month. We're planning one on blockchain. So this will be a continuing series about technology and the impact on the accounting profession. So um, with that, Chris, I, I thank you. Scott, I thank you. And um, hope to get feedback from our audience uh, on what they liked and didn't like. Please let the comments come through to us at uh, executive director at acourse.org. Thank you so much.